how did you find out you had won the MacArthur Fellowship? Well, the funny thing about that is that, um, so I get a call on my cell phone. It's a number that I don't recognize, so I ignore it. And uh, then there's another call from that number, and I ignore that again. And like on the third time, I pick it up, and somebody basically on the other side says, yes, uh, this is so-and-so from the MacArthur Foundation, and we have a potential donor that is interested in space debris and has questions, and clearly you're an expert in that. And so we wanted to know, would you be amenable to answering this potential donor's questions? And I kind of do that stuff a lot. So mm -hmm. I said, yeah, sure. And they were like, well, um, we're not ready to ask you the questions yet, but basically we'll call you next week. And now you know this number, and so... Uh, you'll be able to know that it's us calling and we really appreciate your time. So I just let time go by and sometimes these things come, come to fruition, sometimes they don't. And yeah, so like a week later, I get the call from this number and uh, the same person, uh, you know, answers and, and stuff. And so we start talking a little bit and she's like, so are you still willing to answer this potential donor's questions? And I said, yeah, sure. She's like, well, that's not really the reason I'm calling. Um, stand by and there's a group of people that want to congratulate you because you just became a MacArthur Fellow. Wow. So it was all a ruse. It was awesome. <laughs> like I, it was completely unexpected. Um, yeah, I was floored. I couldn't believe it. What did you do for the rest of the day? <laughs> work. Yeah, just back to yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. just back into my routine. But uh, no, it was, I mean, to this day, it's still a bit unbelievable to me, so... So for the seven or eight people who have not seen your TED Talk, can you summarize what it is that you work on? Right. So my background is in astrodynamics, which is the science that studies motion of stuff in space. And my work is really focused on trying to understand and characterize the population of human-made objects orbiting the Earth, everything from working satellites to space garbage. All right. Well, so kind of just walk me through what we're seeing here. Yeah. If you would. So one of the things that uh, I developed here at UT Austin was this thing called Astrograph, which is really this software that brings in multiple sources of information about stuff in space. And so every dot that you see here is a human-made object orbiting the Earth. Um, the cyan dots are things that work and everything else is garbage. And uh, I co-founded this company called Privateer with Alex Fielding and Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. And our application takes Astrograph and basically is the commercial kind of version of Astrograph and it's called Wayfinder. And so we have some partnership with Omega, but you can kind of see, you know, different orbits and that sort of stuff. And I can actually uh, zoom out a little bit here and you can kind of get a better idea of all the stuff up there. And again, holy smokes. Yeah, that that's just... Uh, and you're not even seeing all the objects. I don't have all the objects turned on because it would be overwhelming. But this is like a very big bulk of them. But um, yeah, it's busy. And, and the dots are not to scale, but just kind of show locations when, you know, where you have some of these things. When did you realize the magnitude of the space junk problem? So I realized the magnitude of the space junk problem probably somewhere around 2006. Uh, I had left my job working for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a spacecraft navigator working on Mars missions. And I relocated to Maui to work with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, there are some telescopes on top of Mount Haleakala on the island. And I came to realize that the Department of Defense was maintaining a catalog in 2006 of about 26,000 objects ranging in size from cell phone to the space station out of which only 1,200 were working and everything else was trash. So it was like 96% of all human-made stuff orbiting the Earth that we were tracking was garbage. And so it, essentially a satellite comes up and very few of them come down. Is yeah, that right? well, yeah. So the rate of launch far <clears throat> exceeds the, the, the rate of things re-entering uh, the Earth's atmosphere if it's sufficiently low. And once these things are on these kind of orbital highways, once they die, they keep on going at very fast speeds. Uh, every once in a while, two of these things will collide with each other and break up into smaller pieces. Every once in a while, a rocket body that took a satellite up there that's still in orbit might explode and become smaller pieces as well. And now all those smaller pieces are now hazards to working satellites. So yeah, on that point, like bring it home for us. What, what is the urgency of the problem? How does this affect 
uh, everyday people. Yeah, so the urgency is that our society is more and more reliant on technology, and that technology is in itself more reliant on space-based infrastructure, satellites, providing unique data, whether it's looking down for monitoring the war in Ukraine, climate change monitoring, communication, financial transactions, so on and so forth. And none of these satellites have a force field like in Star Trek or Star Wars to avoid getting pummeled by something and then not working anymore. And we don't have these things sitting on shelves. And these orbital highways are becoming more and more congested because things stay there for very, very long times. And we just keep on launching stuff uh, you know, every few weeks. And because of that congestion and that hazard, we could lose the ability to use space for humanity's benefit. Are most satellites geosynchronous? N no, so most of the satellites are in low Earth orbit. And like this one here is from Planet Lab, you can kind of see, and let me just paint that orbit right there. And uh, most of these things are in low Earth orbit. And low Earth orbit goes from about 100 kilometers in altitude to about 1,000 or 1,200 kilometers in altitude. So most, most things are in LEO. But then the, the, the geo orbit that you're talking about, if I zoom out, it's kind of this ring that you see, the Goldilocks ring. Mm -hmm. So that ring is geo, and it takes a satellite about 24 hours to go around once. And then low Earth orbit, most of these objects are going around, you know, every 90 minutes. So okay. I mean, because if they were all geosynchronous, there wouldn't really be a problem, right? Well, the <laughs> they thing wouldn't is, be running into each other. Well, the, so thing, much. the interesting thing is that there's this graveyard orbit, which is like a like a landfill equivalent uh, past geo. But a lot of those objects uh, are now coming back and crossing the geo belt. So that is an issue. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. They're getting out of their lane. They're getting out of their lane because they're dead objects. So speaking of space station, yeah, uh, astronauts on a spacewalk, if they if they were to be hit, it's by, a bad day by something like you said, like a painted. It's a over. Chip. It's they, over. It's they they bleed out before they yep. get to the back Probably. to the ship, right? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and you can't predict when that's, that's going to happen because you know these are untrackable pieces, and it's it's literally that small. I mean, it's that's it's right. Any any size, right? Well, like, so so the any, thing is, right, a, a bullet uh, traveling at the speed of a bullet does a lot of damage. So imagine something half the size of a bullet, but traveling 15 times its speed. Yeah. Bad day, as you say. A bad day. <laughs> so let's talk solutions now. How, how do we, first of all, how do we stop the bleeding? How do we, um, is it just putting fewer into orbit or what, what's your recommendation on so, that? So the recommendation that I have is for us to develop a circular space economy that focuses first and foremost on the prevention of pollution by trying to incentivize companies to create uh, reusable and recyclable satellites and rockets. So just like we're trying to minimize single-use plastics, can we minimize single-use satellites and rockets? And SpaceX has done a good job showing that you can reuse rockets. We don't have reusable or recyclable satellites, so that would be the next step. If satellites and rockets uh, can't be made to be reusable and recyclable, the next step then is responsible disposal. And right now, uh, disposal for many people is just letting your satellite die and hoping and wishing that Mother Nature do something about it. That's abandonment. That's not really disposing. So if we can responsibly dispose, that would be the next kind of thing in, instead of abandonment. So that would be the thing that I would definitely recommend. Some of those objects will have to get removed. So that's called uh, active debris remediation. And then debris mitigation is the prevention of further and, debris. And then how, so in my mind, I have this wily e. coyote inspired <laughs> idea of a huge magnet in space that you get up there and then you turn it on and it attracts stuff to it. Like, uh, you know, that, that probably is not realistic. It's probably not how it would work. Well, so like how can you, how do you clean it up? How do you clean up the mess? Yeah. So the cleaning up the mess, it has to be a hybrid approach. Uh, most of the stuff up there uh, is not, uh, magnetic, so so the magnet. Yeah, it's not. It's it's not non-ferrous materials. Uh, so the magnet wouldn't work on on most of the stuff up there. But there are a lot of ideas from the fishing industry, like harpoons and nets and that sort of stuff, oh. that have been applied to a couple of these things. Grappling arms. So you know, there's no uh, Lord of the Rings one technology to to rule them all sort of stuff. It has to be a mix of things depending on the object that you want to remove. Is Sputnik still up there? No. 
That's not. Oh, darn. I thought that would be pretty sweet to be able to capture. It. I'm so but, glad and, that at least some of these things are re-entering, right? Because if, if <laughs> nothing came back, then, then actually things would be a lot worse. Sure. So this other screen that you <clears> kind of see over here, this is uh, what we call our conjunction streaming service. And so we're asking ourselves the question, if we look about you know 20,000 objects, we're, com we're comparing uh, the location of about 20,000 objects with each other. And we're asking the question, over the next 20 minutes, which pair of these is going to come within uh, six miles of each other? And if so, show me. So all these are things that are crisscrossing each other at relative speeds of about 15 times the speed of a bullet coming within uh, six miles of each other over the next 20 minutes continuously. So it's, it's getting busier. And you can see the histogram, the bulk of the stuff is probably around eight or 900 kilometer altitude. Most of the things are crisscrossing at relative speeds of 15 kilometers per second. And the, the spikes are things that are crisscrossing very rapidly. The things that are flatliners are spending a lot of time with close to each other. So low relative speed. So this, these are things mated to the space station. Here you probably have a couple of satellites owned by a specific country that are doing some sort of rendezvous and proximity operation. But all the other things that look spiky are just things that are crisscrossing each other. The green dots are two objects that are working. The yellow dots, one's working and one's dead. And the red dots, both are dead. Most people have heard of an astrophysicist. What's the difference between that and an astrodynamicist? Right, so the astrophysicist, uh, not being one, I'm gonna take the liberty of just <laughs> saying that um, my perspective is that an astrophysicist focuses more on origins of the universe, cosmology, these sorts of things. Whereas an astrodynamicist is really focused on understanding uh, and being able to predict the, the motion of things in space. As I understand it, we were born in San Francisco, uh, moved to Venezuela at six, and then back here in, in the armed forces. Um, how did that varied upbringing inform who you are, do you think? I will say that uh, I have lived a very rough life. Um, lots of uh, traumatic experiences, both in the United States, uh, in Venezuela, and then when I was in the military. I would say that, uh, you know, I'm a blue collar PhD. Mm. Um, I've always been curious uh, since I was a kid. You know, biology was the thing that I was most focused on when I was in high school. It was when AIDS came out, I wanted to cure AIDS. Um, but I'd say that because of the experiences that I've been through, I had a choice to either succumb to my emotions and just be an angry person or choose a path informed by compassion. And uh, I've chosen the path informed by compassion. And because of that, uh, I have a lot of empathy for the earth and, and, and for all life. And I want nothing more than to for my life to be of service it's almost you know one of the things that i've told people before is i want my the pain that i've been through i want my pain to be of service to other people i want i want the trauma that i've been through to not be for nothing i wanted to be for something and, and if i could give back and if somehow my life could be uh, of benefit to humanity then i feel that to some extent you know whatever i went through has has been worth it was there a moment that you can remember making that decision between those yeah. two paths that you took? I was 16 about? years old. I was in military school, which was a boarding school in Venezuela. And um, I had been through some really horrible hazing uh, type stuff, which I'll, I'll spare the camera uh, on the details. But this was to say that I lost the desire to live. Um, I, I was, um, you know, I was in this boarding school. I couldn't go home for several months. Um, I was under severe like hazing and these sorts of things. I lost a desire to live and something really uh, magic happened in that space where I felt I lost every and anything that I ever cared for. Um, I, f I was in, you know, completely nude in every sense of the word except phys physically, but like spiritually, emotionally, all these things. Mm -hmm. I was devastated. And in that space, I came into contact with let's say a connection to the universe, a oneness. And I felt that I was in this infinite ocean of love and compassion, which was inexplicable to me. And that's the thing that turned it around for me. And I couldn't 
I couldn't believe it. And in a place where I, I, it was just nothing but hatred and anger, I found this kind of ocean of love and compassion. And that's what I resonated with. And, and, and that really, I'll say that saved me. That experience saved me. Um, I mean, it's kind of a miracle in a way. It is. <laughs> it sounds like it was all from the outside. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to honor that miracle. I'm trying to honor that moment of connectedness and that honor that moment of understanding that love and compassion. Related to that, I read a place where you said, humanity finds itself plagued by unacknowledged existential crises because it has forgotten the interconnectedness amongst all things in its intergenerational contract of stewardship. Absolutely. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, so, um, so I hold the belief that uh, there is a unifying fabric to all things in, in the universe. There is that interconnectedness that I honor and uh, respect. But then beyond that, um, you know, part of the spiritual experiences that I've had, one of them was in Alaska. And in seeing the disparity between Native Alaskans and Western uh, civilization and the displacement of these Native uh, Alaskans and what uh, the idea of ownership really asks us to exercise and claim rights, whereas stewardship asks us to claim responsibility and how pockets of these indigenous people have not forgotten this intergenerational contract of stewardship over ownership and to say, I'm here, I'm now, uh, I, the only way for me to survive is if I have a successful conversation with the environment. And in that successful conversation, I'm here to be a steward and I have a responsibility to take care of this. That's the thing that, that has been mostly abandoned. And that's the thing that I feel that my dharma, my inner calling, is to raise awareness about that and try to recruit empathy towards embracing stewardship again. And so in one sense, this work about space junk is just a lens for making that, that larger point. Right? Absolutely. So, so the thing is, is that as a space environmentalist, and I became one through these spiritual ex experiences, as a space environmentalist and the belief of the, of the interconnectedness, I recognize that these problems are not just unique to space. We find them in exploration of land, air, and ocean. So land, air, ocean, and space are really uh, an interconnected system of systems. And I seek to raise this awareness using space as a lens. Absolutely. Are, are your parents still alive? They are not. Um, what do you think, Elsie uh, and Abraham, would make of what you've made of yourself? What do you think they would think or are thinking of you at, at this moment? <laughs> I think that my parents would say, you know, you could have you could have stopped a long time ago, like we were proud of you a while ago. You can take your foot off the gas pedal and <laughs> have some more fun, which I'm listening to loud and clear. Like at this point in my life, um, I'm still dedicated towards this work, but at the same time, I'm also uh, I'm also trying to focus on some self-love and filling my life with more moments of joy. So, message heard. <laughs> um, I read that you worked on uh, a space mission design at Los Alamos. And I was not aware that Los Alamos had anything to do with space. Can you uh, describe what you were doing there and, and why they have a space mission <laughs> a design program. Yeah, so interestingly enough, when I was an undergrad at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona, I was a tour guide. And on one of my campus tours, uh, this guy, Mick Trujillo, and his uh, daughter, Allison, came to the campus to visit. And after the tour, he said, young man, I'm very impressed by your knowledge about you know aerospace and all these things. You know, I work at the Los Alamos National Lab. Would you be interested in doing an internship there? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So he got me into Los Alamos's internship programs. And I said, I'm a space person. What does the lab do with space? He said, well, we have a program in non-proliferation non and international security where we're trying to monitor from space nuclear activity type ah, stuff. Okay. And so there are a couple of satellites, Alexis and Forte, that 
uh, have special antennas to kind of monitor those sorts of things. So, And when did you take the turn into academia? That didn't happen until later. I mean, I, I never thought of myself as being an academic. Uh, I know that my advisor, the late George Bourne at the University of Colorado at Boulder, who actually uh, studied here at UT, uh, he took his space stuff from UT and, and started the program at Boulder. He wanted me to be an academic eventually. He's like, look, do your time at NASA. Do like I did. I spent some time at NASA and then I came back to academia. You should do the same. You'd be an awesome professor. But I always looked at professors as being like a lot smarter than me and a lot more uh, technically capable than myself. And so I just decided ah, I'm just going to be out in the world and do stuff. Um, it wasn't until you know, later in life that I decided I had enough time doing my work directly as a government employee for the Air Force, a research lab. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I've kept up my publication record good enough and these sorts of things. Let's try this out because it's something that scares me. And, um, and yeah, and so here I am. So 2017, you get to UT. Why did you pick Texas? For the work that I'm trying to do, it's very transdisciplinary. And so by that, I mean really looking at solving problems where you go across disciplinary boundaries to get a capability. And I had gotten an offer from University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, University of Arizona, the systems engineering, and then University of New South Wales in Canberra, Australia, and here. And out of the places, I said, where do I believe that I could really apply this transdisciplinarity the best. I looked at UT and solid aerospace program, but also the Odin Institute of Computational Engineering and Sciences is pretty unique. Um, the Moody College of Communication for TV, film, media is awesome. Uh, there's also the LBJ School of Policy and that sort of thing. And there's a, like an environmental sciences institute. And I saw all these little grains that maybe I could bring together and, and do like a non-homogeneous loaf of bread that could like answer answer uh, the mail on this. And so that's why I chose UT. I think you've just written our new slogan, a non-homogeneous loaf of bread. <laughs> I'm here all Can week. We okay. yeah. what, what is it that you teach? Is it one course? Is it more than one course? Yeah, so there's usually, um, you know, three classes that I teach here at UT. One of them is on global navigation satellite systems like GPS, and that's an undergraduate elective. Um, there's another class that I teach undergrads, which is engineering probability and statistics, which is the basis of a lot of uh, the work because there's a lot of uncertainty in where all these things are located and how they're moving. And then the graduate class that I teach is in statistical methods of orbit determination, which has been the basis of my career as well. So those are the classes that I teach here at UT. So you finally feel smart enough to be a professor? I not? don't feel smart enough to be a professor. I'm just hoping that my students don't realize how unsmart I am. You're just faking it. I'm <laughs> faking just, it I'm you just faking it. it.